Hello, good morning, and welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Chen Berlin. So. I'm Kairi Okikeli. I am Ayo Makine. Welcome to ST. And good morning from the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Yes, indeed. So, these are loaded today. We've got Mr. Dayakin to be here with us to uh, take us through some of these headlines, as troublesome as they may seem. Good to see you this morning. Yeah, let's, let, let, let's delve into this. And, um, okay, uh, quite a number of them have the same theme, headline, lead headline, that is. And incidentally, The Guardian is on the same page with a lot of them today. So, take a look at that. Buari presidency cracks. Three big words, three big words from this big lead headline, as a matter of fact. You know, there may have been a comment or two about this kind of indication, but this one, this looks like something that oh wait a minute depending given who they are coming from now look at the writers quite a lot of them as well uh monguno kiari locked in fierce battle of supremacy service chiefs warned against taking orders from chief of staff how chief of staff hijacked presidential powers that's in parentheses now a revelation validates call for Buhari's resignation, says PDP. So that's the political spin to that now. But is it about the message or the messenger? Let me see if I could read some of these quotes on the front page of The Guardian here this morning to see if we could shed a little more light. And that's coming from Pierre Zemmemo, coming from uh, the NSA. And uh, the first of these says, as professionals, you are aware that the security of the Federal Republic of Nigeria requires concerted and centralized efforts taking into account internal, external, and diplomatic factors. It is therefore detrimental to our collective security that the Chief of Staff, who is a non-supervising minister, holds meetings with diplomats, security chiefs, and heads of agencies. That's not all. Look at this other quote. Pursuant to the foregoing, you are by this letter directed to desist from these illegal acts that serve nothing but the continuous undermining of a national security framework. Any breach of this directive will attract displeasure of Mr. President. He didn't say anything about the law, he just says, well, maybe in subsequent memos. But this excerpts of this memo to, well, who knows who to, but then. <laughs> What do you make of this? Very strong words. Um, this is um, an internal battle that will leave no winners. No, it's external. <laughs> <laughs> no, Everybody no, knows it. No winners <clears throat> at all. Um, the troublesome, the most troublesome part about this is that mm. um, the COS seems to have been having meetings with the service chiefs outside the knowledge of the president, which mm. is quite troublesome. Um, the COS has no direct chain of command with the uh, security chiefs. At the end of the day, it's the National Security Advisor who really is the umbrella overhead of all the security apparatus. And I would think that if the COS is communicating with the service chiefs, the NSA should at least be in the know or should have at least given his assent to it. And it's even, like I said, all the more troublesome that the president knew nothing about it. That is really scary. Um, this goes to show, I remember uh, the first lady a while back said the influence of the COS is overwhelming within uh, the presidency. And this certainly seems to give a lot of credence to what the first lady uh, was saying. But when we remember that uh, I think this, upon the second coming, uh, there was a time, if we remember properly, where, uh, was it the president that said that the ministers had, they had to direct the memos to the COS, you know, before yeah. they eventually get to him. Yes. Could that have been a thin line, which, you know, the COS, I'm, I'm just doing my job as president director. Uh, uh, pass your memos through the COS is different from the COS summoning the security chiefs and having meetings with them meetings that ostensibly relate to the security of the country, to which he's not an expert and neither does he have a portfolio. Um, the COS is a gatekeeper for the president. Anybody who wants to see him, any memo that needs to go to the president, passes through the COS for scrutiny, for appraisal, and for determination. A good percentage of those memos and those requirements don't get to the president. They get 
minuted on and directed to the appropriate yeah, but agencies. Functions of COSs, but at the federal, state level, there are things that they can, they do, perhaps required to do that the president may not be aware of some of them. So uh, to that extent, does this excuse anything? No, it doesn't. Because at the end of the day, whether the, 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 the issue of is it within the COS's jurisdiction to begin to assert authority over agencies that have their own chain of command. But does that uh, meeting, does it generally in itself produce any executive or require any executive action? from whoever is involved. Not necessarily. At the end of the day, the box stops at the president's table. Which so is whatever they why... decide, whatever they decide in those meetings, mm. nonetheless, they'll have to get the president's asset. However, I can understand why the NSA would begin to feel marginalized or undermined within his own position, because it is his authority to actually be the one to summon these people, have meetings with them, and make decisions that then go to the presidency for mm. consideration. So he sort of has been uh, sidelined mm. in his own area of responsibility. So I can understand why he wouldn't be too happy. But are we considering, I mean, there's a lot of questions, but then this is meant to be a confidential memo, a letter as it were. Are we considering, how did this get leaked in the first place now? What is this meant to achieve? If you could just postulate maybe, what do you see happening as a result of this? It's very troublesome that a confidential memo would get into the public space, especially <laughs> social media. How it leaked, why it leaked, there's probably an agenda. That's um, the way of the world. <laughs> <laughs> How do newsmen get material? <laughs> so, so, so now you see why when all of a sudden the government is saying we have to regulate social media. No, it's, not just social, it's not just in this country that memos leak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm no, just no, asking, no, I mean, no. leaking this, what do you think it will achieve? I mean, if you could just postulate maybe. Well, it, it, it definitely has thrown up a lot more chaos within the system and as we look at it um, there's already chaos within the party in APC there's now chaos within the presidency some people are saying there's chaos within the presidency's household as we as it is so all of a sudden you see a lot of disruption in the system and um, that could possibly be speaking towards 2023 it could be speaking towards undermining uh, the efficient flow of governance at this point it could be the opposition who's doing what they do best it could be internal feuds and and jostling for power jostling for superiority there's always conflict within power structures so I don't think this is unusual to see for example if you look at the organogram I don't necessarily think the COS mm. is superior to the NSA in terms so of lines of authority. The NSA doesn't have to pass his memos through the COS to see the president. The president has ordered that any memo that has to come to him should go through the COS. But the, the NSA does not have to have the COS someone the people who work for the NSA. That's where the difference is. But when you say... How the implication of this, this is not just any matter, mm -hmm. this is security, the national security. Which issues. is on the front burner of issues today. This, the national security Give, given is the, the way major things are issue. Now. So that means people may just begin to extrapolate and think, could those be could part of the reason why we are where we are, where you know, things are going on the way they are. Without Could a they doubt. have an excuse? W without a doubt, that will give, uh, give a lot more momentum to the notion that uh, insecurity is rife in the country today, possibly because there's inefficiencies in the chain of command. So if all of a sudden you don't know who has the authority to speak to who and who has the right to talk to the presidency about things that are happening, the service chiefs don't know who to um, confide in, they don't know who... It, it doesn't give a sense of confidence that... They don't know? That, well, if, if... No, 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 I'm not... No, but if all of a sudden the COS is giving them instructions and the NSA is saying, you're not supposed to be talking to this person, where do you think the service chiefs stand? They're confused. And don't forget, this is... There was word previously, too, that the former Minister of Defence also had some sort of clash with uh, the NSA at the time, but he didn't return. So all of those things in security circles where they had talked about uncoordinated efforts, uh, service chiefs not working together, all of those questions about how, and now this one. How do you see this ended? The left hand seems to not know what the right hand is doing. Um, there's now speculation that the NSA 
may get fired if we follow precedent because oh, yeah. uh, the last time somebody locked horns with him, eventually they got sidelined and asked to, to uh, be relieved of their post. So um, if, as is speculated, the COS does have a lot of influence over the president, then I don't see this ending well for the NSA. Well, well, well. Look at this one as well at the bottom strip. It also has implications on security. Telecoms firms fume as Boko Haram destroys masts in Yobe. It's time to tackle insecurity, says Abdul Salami. Three soldiers promoted for gallantry against terrorists. So, how will these telecom firms, you know, handle all of this? This is costing them serious. Then this, of course, this has huge impact on security. If you have to do, uh, if you're breaking your communication network. It, it, it leaves you prone to some of these attacks and you can't get help. Yes, indeed. Um, it, it's a shame that all of a sudden uh, uh, terrorism and uh, insecurity is now extending into the telecom sector because that's our lifeline really. Uh, communications is our ability to reach out, our ability to communicate. And when all of a sudden this infrastructure is um, under threat, um, it definitely undermines our efforts at keeping ourselves a lot more secure. So, feed or no feud, somebody needs to address this. Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at the Nigerian Tribune, which leads with another angle to the same story. This one from the PDP, as you'll expect. With NSA's memo, Kiari presiding over security matters is national tragedy. That's on page four. And, you know, he was just saying that this, this needs to be dealt with. How do you expect the presidency to respond to this? Well, um, uh, first of all, he should make a statement directly to the people and explain he, that his, his spokespersons, his oh. spokespersons. I actually personally think that the president needs to address the people directly a lot more. Mm -hmm. I think we would uh, be a lot more comfortable. We'd have a lot more confidence if we heard from him more often. Uh, Mr. Adeshino is in the news a bit too much. I know that's his job, but he is... Um, not inspiring the kind of confidence we need to hear from the president, especially at this time. Don't, don't let of... him turn us back now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. I did this work. No. no, no, he won't turn us back. He will listen. He will hear this, and he will say, maybe, maybe they're speaking the truth. Maybe I do need to be a little bit more open. Yeah, but and, and, and given the way the president is, yes. if it's taciturn, then. Yes. The media is up to do the jobs. Absolutely, but not. But you're there, saying that there he comes needs a time, to speak a little Yes, more. there comes a time when all of a sudden the media aid speaking for him is not enough. We're now in a time of great, great insecurity. We're in a time of great concern for the people. People are worried. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden we're seeing things happening in our backyard that we haven't experienced in decades in this country. Um, uh, it hits us right in, in the gut. And we need to hear from our leader and let him inspire us and assure us. It's one thing to say Boko Haram has been decimated to the point that they are no longer a threat. And in the one hand, we're hearing that. And on the other hand, another bomb is going off somewhere else. So if he talks to us, he might calm our tensions down a little bit and inspire some confidence in us that, look, I'm on top of this situation. Trust me, you gave me your suffrages just a year ago with the confidence that I led you right the first four years, I kept you as safe as possible, and another four years, I want to be able to build upon my initial successes. That's a script right there. Successes. <laughs> That's a script right there. <laughs> it wasn't well, he's a journalist. I see, I see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you see, uh, right under that picture that shows, you know, excerpts from the memo, uh, nine northern states responsible for Nigeria's 50% malnutrition burden has come from the Emir of Kano, says Awolowo's free education benefited his people. It's on page seven, but take a look at this. Yes. Or your inaugurates park managers, disciplinary committee. We, we, we still hear about the NURTW, but park managers for your state. Do you, do you think this is, uh, you know, version 2.0 of <laughs> NURTW? <laughs> well, NURTW has actually been proscribed in your state yeah. for a number of months. Mm -hmm. And in spite of their proscription, they've still continued with some of their activities in these motor parks. The point is, the NURTW has a vast membership, which has become a f an alternative government in its own right. And all of a sudden, some governments are standing up and saying, we will not have you 
um, being lawless. We will not have you uh, taking control of government functions. So what Oyo State has done is stand up to the NURTW. So we proscribed your activities. And as a result, we're going to put government agents in the motor parks to run these motor parks and accrue the revenue to the government as opposed to the union. It's there is going to be quite a bit of pushback. Mm -hmm. well, it, it's interesting because, um, well, the uh, rockers between the uh, unions is as a result of their factions. Yes. Incidentally, the head of this park managers is a member of the NURTW, a former chairman of the NURTW in Oyo yeah. State. Yes. So, so no fancy attire, even though fancy name. <laughs> so, oh, um, just as you said, perhaps, perhaps that's why there could be some pushback. Yes. Uh, and I also understand that some security has been um, beefed up mm. just in case that such a pushback would come. Yes, the government is expecting that it will not go down well with uh, some, people. Uh, uh, some people. Mm. Um, the leader you talked about is seen as maybe perhaps a turncoat of sorts who has flipped to the other side. And yes, he's retired. He's a former leader. Now he's standing on the side of the government, which is a no-no. So um, they see that as a betrayal, probably. In addition, you've hit them where it hurts most, their pocketbook. Mm -hmm. all, of a, all of a sudden, the revenue that accrued to them is now going to the government. Mm. So um, um, they can't be too pleased. Well, park manager does sound kind of good. But that's an Nigerian <laughs> Tribune this morning. Okay, the Daily Trust newspaper leads with pretty much the same story. Crack in uh, Buhari's team as NSA accuses Kiari of sabotage, front page of Daily Trust newspaper in fighting dangerous for Nigeria, ex-military officer says and presidency, mum. That's on the front page. Lead story of the Daily Trust newspaper this morning, and um, and of course uh, there is the uh, preview of what's likely to happen today at the Supreme Court. Anxiety in Imo Zamfara. Supreme Court hears governorship applications today. That story is on page forty-one. Are you anxious? <laughs> <laughs> Historically, the Supreme Court does re reverse itself. When a situation arises down the road that speaks to a decision they've made in the past, because Supreme Court justices, just like you and me, are human beings. They are affected by what happens in society. They're affected by public opinion. They're not immune to what the public thinks about what is happening. However, it is very rare, if it has ever happened before, that a decision they made today, and nothing has changed beyond the actual facts that they examined. Let's remember that there was argument from both sides before the Supreme Court. They didn't make this decision in a vacuum. They didn't do it in isolation. They were fully informed, and both sides had the opportunity to present their cases, and the judges themselves looked. They're not Supreme Court justices on a whim. They're selected because of their erudition, their experience, um, their deep-seated knowledge of the law, and their commitment and passion. So I don't think they reached that decision frivolously. However, I think what may be a lacuna in the outcome that people are uh, a bit taken aback about is that the Supreme Court can only consider the issues that were raised by the parties in the dispute. So if in the pleadings you didn't allude to a particular point of law, it's outside the jurisdiction of what they can consider. So if we're not looking at it and we're saying, well, uh, the APC candidate didn't have this and didn't have that, and if it wasn't pled in the issues at the lower court, the Supreme Court will not consider it. So all of a sudden it can look like this is a travesty of justice, but if it was not in the issues that were brought forth for deliberation and adjudication, Supreme Court won't look at it. Well, perhaps goes to what Chimley said that the Supreme Court is not um, Santa Claus. Let's go to Malkwe. You know, we just have some papers she wants to look at. Malkwe. This morning, and they have a very different headline. If you take a look at it, uh, it says coronavirus. NAVDAC raises the alarm of a drug insecurity, says Nigeria imports 70% of medicines from China. India, others. So the alarm is there for us to see. Uh, I'll quickly take a look at other stories quickly and then we'll decide on one to talk about. Anxiety as Supreme Court decides on emails and for appeals today. Court stops INEC 
INEX the registration of political parties. Uh, that's another one to consider. But if you look just on top of the nameplate, or beneath the nameplate rather, ICT sector grows by 3 trillion naira on stock exchange. Kogi governor warns MDAs against contract fraud. But let me take you up on the coronavirus story, which is the lead headline. NAVDAQ raises alarm over drug insecurity. Uh, does this bring any anxiety for you? Well, well yes, it does. Um, you know, at this point, we're lucky that we haven't so far had any cases, reported cases, confirmed cases of coronavirus in Africa. But, but th th there's very little confidence that we are fully prepared if indeed it does cross uh, the waters and comes to, to these shores. Um, of course, the prayer is that we never have to deal with an outbreak of um, uh, such, because even China itself at the moment, in as much as they're working hard to contain it, there's more and more reported cases on a daily basis. So if a good majority of the drugs that come into this country are from China, from India, from these places, um, I think there's cause for concern. I think uh, uh, um, health authorities um, should ramp up uh, all of um, the emergency protocols that would lead to, we're, we're already contending with Lassa fever as it is. And that in and, it's, in and of itself is stretching our capabilities to manage uh, epidemics. So if all of a sudden now coronavirus becomes a consideration, I would say we're ill prepared to deal with an outbreak of that uh, in this country at the moment. We'll be there for leadership newspapers. Okay, well, take a look at the next one then. Oh dear. Killing of farmers by herdsmen. Eight corpses exhumed in Delta for investigation. Two victims burned to ashes, two soldiers shot, UPU frowns on killings, urges Buhari to stop killings, military to investigate soldiers' involvement, Nigeria at crossroads in reverse gear without staring, uh, ascribed to Anglican bishop. Khan urges Christians to unite, Buhari still popular in Borno presidency. So all of this lumped into this one, but this definitely, exhuming bodies, always emotional. Yes, um, you can imagine how the families of those people feel. Their wounds have been opened up again. Um, this issue of herdsmen uh, killing is something that we really need to get to the bottom of in this country. Um, I, I can't understand how, um, and I, how, how private citizens, whether as a group, whether as individuals, can overwhelm the government to a point that, that our security forces are not able to quell such an insurrection. Herdsmen should not be killing people. And if they're doing it, the security forces should be able to apprehend them and bring them to justice. And then this one is above this lead story. Just to mention it before we move on. 1,500 Nigerians stranded in Ghana. Apologize to travelers, Elijah Moke tells British Airways. So uh, if what's going on with British Airways, uh, is it uh, uh, Emirates as well or something? So they need to address that. But I can't miss this picture. Look at that picture on the front page. I'm a technical leader in the Kitty House. One of the leaders of the Southwest Security Outfit in combat regalia addressing the Kitty State House of Assembly yesterday. This picture speaks volumes. <laughs> yes, it does. It's drama. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So you can always check, take a, a look at the back pages. Uh, oh, uh, Man U fans, okay. And Chelsea fans, they clashed yesterday. You know the result. And I think the lines were blurred because if you're a Nigerian and you're a Chelsea fan, you're most likely somebody <laughs> Gala who's playing for Manchester United. But just for mention, the Daily Times front page talks about insecurity. Nigeria is at a crossroad, Lawan wants leaders to do less of talking and show more action in tackling challenges. That, as well as other stories, uh, you'll find on the front page of the Daily Times this morning. All right, so um, there you go. That uh, a look at some of the dailies this morning. Mr. DJ Kintobi publishes uh, TCN. Thank you for your thoughts this morning. And I hope to take that script too. Always uh, a pleasure. All right, <laughs> all right then. So we're back in a moment. Stay with us.